An Ontario court recently ruled that the policing powers of the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals are unconstitutional. It gave the province one year to rewrite the framework for how to enforce laws that protect animals from abuse and neglect. Joining us now for more, Brian Schiller. He's general counsel for the Ontario SPCA. Kendra Coulter, Chancellor's Chair for Research Excellence and Chair of the Labour Studies Department at Brock University. Akash Maharaj, Chair of the University of Guelph's new Equine Public Policy Group and CEO of the think tank The Mosaic Institute. And Camille Labchuk, Executive Director for the animal rights group Animal Justice. And it is delightful to have you back here, whom we haven't seen in many, many years. It's lovely to be back. And you back here, who I think we last saw on election night some time ago when you were doing the work with the Green Party. And you here, who was here nine years ago on this <laughs> issue as well. And I don't think you've ever been here before, have you? Okay, good. Happy to be here. Happy to have everybody here. Let's just do, Sydney Cohen is our director today. Sydney, you want to bring this graphic up? We just want to bring, we want to bring some background to bear here because there's a lot we need to know to get ready for this discussion. In 1919, a hundred years ago, the Ontario government gave the Ontario SPCA, a private charity, law enforcement powers for animal welfare cases. A guy named Jeffrey Bogarts, a paralegal in eastern Ontario, brought the Attorney General of Ontario to court saying it was unconstitutional for the government to give the OSPCA those powers. The court heard arguments last year. Camille's group, Animal Justice, intervened in the case. The judge ruled on January 2nd, 2019, just earlier this month, and created a new principle of justice that law enforcement agencies must be transparent and accountable. And the judge said that the OSPCA, as a private charity, was not transparent or accountable to the public, so their law enforcement powers, the judge said, are unconstitutional. And the judge suspended the implementation of the ruling for one year so the province could reform animal welfare enforcement, unless, of course, the government appeals, and we're still waiting to find out about that. Okay, again, Brian, with some more background in place, how did the OSPCA get these powers of enforcement 100 years ago in the first place? Uh, you know, I think it was really based in the fact that it's uh, um, animal welfare is very community-based, and the governments of the time were, were leaving these to communities, and uh, uh, eventually it was this legislation comes into place and it leaves all policing powers in the hands of uh, uh, the OSPCA, at least in the province of Ontario, and to what deal was with the, it. What was the OSPCA's involvement in the case, in the court case? In, in this court case yeah. recently, uh, it was it offered assistance as requested by uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General. Did it have a view one way or another as to whether or not you should or should not have these enforcement powers? It expressed no view. We expressed no view one way or the other. Our goal is to ensure that there's animal protection legislation that most effectively helps animals in this province. Okay. Camille, why did your group intervene? Well, we're looking at this as uh, Ontario animal welfare being in crisis. And we saw this as a case where animal issues were going to be at the heart of the case, but nobody there was speaking on behalf of the animals. So you have Mr. Bogarts, who is concerned about property rights of his and other landowners in his community. He's, we should say, he's with the Ontario Landowners Association. This is a kind of a rural eastern Ontario sort of quasi-libertarian group. I would say very libertarian. Okay, that's, okay. Right. that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're concerned about their own rights. The Ministry of the Attorney General is uh, trying to uphold the law because they want to enforce the status quo and the system that's in place. And animal justice felt like we had to be in the court to make sure the judge heard what was best for animals. And for us, transparency and accountability are good for animals when why it comes you, to our law enforcement systems. Why did you feel those two things were lacking in the way the OSPCA did its business? Well, the OSPCA is the only private charity in the province that's allowed to enforce publicly enacted laws. And this is something that exists in many places across the country and, in fact, around the Commonwealth. Uh, the whole system originates back in the 1800s in the UK when the very first cruelty laws were enacted. Everything was a private prosecution at that point. So it wasn't like there was a public police force that would be doing these cases for animals. So the RSPCA sprung up, and that model spread to the Commonwealth. But we think if Our you had royal? a royal SPCA mm -hmm. in the UK, but we think if you had to design the system from scratch today, like all of our other public law enforcement, it would make more sense to do that. And what did you think of the court ruling? Well, the judge actually adopted most of what animal justice requested. Uh, the judge upheld the OSPCA's search powers, so he said that it's appropriate for them to go and do what they need to do to police animal protection in this province. But he said that the system where a private charity without any accountability, so um, oversight by police services legislation, for instance, 
and transparency, so ability to access information, like freedom of information requests. He said that was the problem, and we agreed with that. Hmm. Akash, what was your take on the ruling? I thought it was a great victory for the democratic process for animal welfare, and indeed for the OSPCA itself. I should begin by saying that in my work, I have high regard for the OSPCA, and especially for the people who are involved in it. I think they are generally well-intentioned and motivated by desire to protect animal well-being. Having said that, structurally, the OSPCA is an affront to democratic norms. It's an organization that wields public power and consumes public resources, but is not subject to pu public accountability. It has police powers, including, under certain circumstances, the right to uh, search uh, private property and, and seize private assets, but it is not subject to the Police Services Act. It is not subject to the freedom of, inf of, freedom of information request. It is not subject to oversight or the rulings by the ombudsman. If you're going to wield that sort of public power, which I think they should, you must be publicly accountable. Do you have a view as to why it's lasted the way it has for a hundred years without any, I mean, without too many people anyway, uh, being particularly fussed about all of those things? I think in part it's because most animal welfare um, cases happen outside of, of public scrutiny, outside of public attention. But in addition, this is an old issue. Most people would agree, I think, that modern policing, as we now understand it, started with the Metropolitan Police in, in London. The Met was founded in 1829. The RSPCA was founded in 1824. Hmm. And in fact, the entire police services, the, their uniforms, the rank structure, the titles that they are given, were all actually based on the RSPCA's model of, um, of, of ranks, because they did not want to imitate those of, of um, the military. This is an old system, but clearly the world has moved on since the 1820s. Madam Chair, how did you get to this issue? Well, it's a really significant time to be thinking about, uh, you know, the well-being of animals, but also the people on the front lines who do this work. Uh, so this is uh, the only kind of law enforcement where it's a majority of women, for example. And we actually have slightly more uh, fair inspectors in the TTC than there are animal cruelty investigators for the entire province of Ontario. What do you think that says? I think it says it's a, uh, this is a really important issue and that action is needed. I mean, I mean these were, there were many good reasons to be having these conversations, you know, as, as Camille and Akash have mentioned, about, you know, what is the most efficient and effective way of enforcing the law, uh, of giving animals the protections that they need, the care they need afterwards, of protecting frontline officers, uh, of having a legal enforcement system that is, you know, accountable to the public, respectful of the public, but that also is easy for the public to administer, right? I mean, we want a system that makes sense, that's coherent, uh, that, that works for everyone. So those are the main fa factors that I think think uh, are, are significant and and this is what was perhaps a more of a hypothetical discussion has become very urgent and action is is really needed by the provincial government and what do you think of the court's decision it's, it was an interesting one. I'm not, I'm not a legal expert, but I think it reflects a lot of these public discussions. Uh, and, and, and it makes it very clear. You know, there, this is a model that's been around for 100 years. Uh, you know, like Akash, I too think that, that everyone in, in the OSPCA is motivated by good intentions. They're there because, uh, because they believe in, in animals' well-being. Uh, and the question is, are we uh, setting up a system with the most resources, with the most training, with the most protections in place? There are a number of options, right? So we're at a very important intersection. The government could continue. Down this down this road, but uh, you know, imposing more scrutiny and oversight over the OSPCA, or it could pivot. And if it pivots, there are a number of possibilities and a number of options. We'll return to those options in just a second, Brian. I want to bring you back in because even though this group has been around for a hundred years in Ontario, I don't want to assume that everybody has heard of them or knows what they do. So, can you tell us basically what the Ontario SPCA's range of activities are? Sure. So, the OSPCA part of its responsibilities. Uh, are relate to enforcement of the OSPCA Act. So that deals with uh, the protection of animals. And uh, there are agents and inspectors who lay charges under both the Criminal Code and the OSPCA Act. And how many? Uh, how many charges? Inspectors. Oh, inspectors. Uh, I don't know the precise number right now. About 65. I was going to say, it's, it's precious few for a province yeah, it, of 13 million it people. Is, um, it, it is precious few. It is. Uh, V inadequately resourced, um, but remember that uh, I think being lost in the discussion is that the OSPCA, approximately 75% of its work is in other areas related to sheltering, uh, uh, education, spay and neuter. There are a lot of other activities that are done by employees of the OSPCA who are not agents or inspectors. Having said that, the, the work of those agents and inspectors is very important, 
And uh, there, uh, I agree with Kendra that it's time that there is a very serious discussion within government about whether they want to seriously protect animals in this province, uh, animals who have no voice, animals who uh, day in and day out, we know stories of abuse and neglect, and um, do they not want to adequately protect them? Do you think the OSPCA did its job well? Uh, I think the OSPCA has been doing its job well, will continue to do its job well, and um, is really in need of uh, uh, a, a fulsome discussion with the government and uh, other stakeholders in, uh, in, in discussing what needs to be done to protect animals in a better way. Let me get Camille on that. Do you think the OSPCA was doing its job well? I think the OSPCA does the best it can under the circumstances, but it frankly has been set up to fail. Uh, we have, of course, the structure, which is a problem, so a private charity enforcing public laws. But let's get into the funding for a minute. The OSPCA receives just under $6 million to enforce laws in the entire province of Ontario. And for, some from of the that, government of Ontario. That's right. And, and that only came into place in the last two years. Prior to that, they self-funded everything. To put that in context, we spend about $4.4 billion on policing in this province. So you compare that to the $6 million that we devote exclusively to animals, and it is just, frankly, Steve, a joke. Akash, this is a group that still holds bake sales to be able to fund its work. What do you think that says? It speaks poorly of the, um, of the level of support, public support for what I think most people would agree is a public priority. For the last year that the um, OSPCA published records, they, ha they investigated 15,519 complaints. That's an average of two complaints every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. Um, and that is an enormous amount of public, of, of public activity. The amount of funding that they receive from the government is minuscule and it is relatively new. Um, but th this is an interesting juncture because there are two separate issues on the table. The first is the legitimacy of the OSPCA, which has clearly been, or the legitimacy of it enforcing criminal law, which has clearly been called into question by the court. Right. The second is its effectiveness. But the reality is no government, I think, would or should invest greater resources into the OSPCA until the legitimacy part is fixed first. The real worry that I have is that in the current political climate, there may be, there may be an urge to bring the OSPCA into compliance, not by increasing its accountability, but by stripping of, it, it, of its functions. Let me do, a, Kendra, with you a follow-up on this whole bake sale thing. Do you, do you think it's an issue that on the one hand, they are having to do their own fundraising with things like bake sales, and on the other hand, enforce the law at the same time. Yes, it sets up an organization into a very challenging position. Uh, that said, I also think if the public fully understood the difficulties and the challenges of frontline enforcement of what the officers are doing, what they're experiencing, most of us don't want to look at a picture of an abused animal for more than a second. Mm. These are people who day in and day out for very, very low wages, you know, no pensions, uh, are, are, are having to deal with living animals, dead animals. This is fundamentally about the well-being of the, of the animals with whom we share our homes and communities. But it is also directly linked to human well-being. This is about law enforcement and enforcement of a public law. At the same time, we know there are very clear links between violence against people and violence against animals. So for example, my, my research collaborator, Dr. Amy Fitzgerald, has done research on uh, female victims of domestic violence, so battered women in Canada. And 89% of them reported that there was also abuse of an animal in the home going on simultaneously. Hmm. Right? So there are a lot of connections, in, especially in terms of larger manifestations of harm against animals, so things like dog fighting. It's very common to find narcotics, firearms, etc. So this is about animals, but this is also about public safety more broadly. Do you think that the OSPCA investigators have resources similar to police officers to do their enforcement, although police officers are dealing with humans, not with animals, of course? They don't currently have resources. It's also a real tapestry across the province. There are a number of regions of the province that don't have uh, SPCA coverage or humane society coverage. There are regions of the province uh, where there's an officer who might need to travel five hours to get across the region they're covering, who might not have two-way radios, who might not have any means of reliable communication if they're dependent on cell phones and working in remote areas where they can lose communication. Uh, again, these are very dedicated folks. Uh, I hope that in whatever decision the government makes, uh, their knowledge, their expertise is rec uh, recognized uh, and seen as an mm -hmm. asset. And we've also, uh, you know, a key reason that that funding was provided to the OSPCA was to augment training. 
So now, you know, the, the program of training in, in the OSPCA is actually recognized as being, uh, has been quite strong. Uh, and so we have invested in the training for these officers. Let's use them as a resource and an asset in terms of whatever path we choose. Okay. Brian, um, let me set up this next question this way. Uh, I think there is grand consensus across all of society that nobody wants to see, you know, pet cats, pet dogs uh, harmed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, where it gets more controversial, and I gather this is why this fellow from the Ontario Landowners Association intervened, is that when OSPCA investigators come to, enforcement investigators, uh, come to, let's say, a farm in rural Ontario, because maybe they got a tip that horses aren't being taken care of appropriately, or chickens, cows, whatever, that becomes more problematic. Uh, would you respond to the allegation that the OSPCA in those circumstances may have been playing its hand in too heavy-handed a way? So I have been actively involved in a number of those cases, mm -hmm. and I can say that the inspectors and senior inspectors in some of the cases and agents dealing with some of the more controversial cases um, dealt with them in a very appropriate way. They are uh, individuals with a great deal of knowledge of farming. I can think of one of the senior inspectors who was actively involved in one of the investigations who grew up on a farm, uh, knows a great deal about farming, been trained in uh, dealing with farm animals. And, and let us not forget, frequently when uh, OSP, OSPCA investigators uh, enter farms, they go with uh, large animal veterinarians who are giving advice and direction throughout the investigation. So in any policing situation, there are going to be complaints. That's just the nature of it. And with humans, with animals, the individual that is subject to the investigation frequently has complaints with what is going on. And it's understandable. They have their own perspective on things, but the law is the law. And if you enter a farm and you see that there are animals in crisis, I very recently have been dealing with a case where there are cows on a farm who are not anywhere near receiving the proper uh, uh, care by the farmers, and you have to step in and deal with it. You want to say what part of the province that's happening in? Uh, Western Ontario. That doesn't narrow it down too much, does uh, that's it? That's as far and, as I'm going to narrow okay, it down for okay. you. <laughs> Do you have any reason, Akai, I mean, I know of your history with horses. You're, you're obviously deeply in love with these animals, and you... Uh, and care about them a great deal. Do you have any reason to suspect that the OSPCA has been overly heavy-handed in its approach in rural Ontario on farms? It's an interesting question. I, I was previously head of the National Equestrian Federation, mm -hmm. and so have both a professional and a personal um, connection to this. I would have to say that the it's highly inconsistent. It's highly inconsistent across the province. And one of the issues has been precisely the question of whether the OSPCA has the resources to maintain a band of standards. So I would say the OSPCA has been criticized in parts of um, rural Canada for being excessively heavy handed, for having responding to complaints that have been made by people who may be driving past a farm and have no real understanding of what it is that they're seeing. Equally, it has received complaints that it has not shown sufficient zeal in prosecuting or pursuing cases of what people feel are manifest abuses of large animals, mm. especially horses. Um, I think part of it does go back to resource issue, ensuring that there are enough resources so that there are minimum standards across the province. But I think also it goes back to the accountability issue. And that is the one area where people tend to become the most exercised is when the OSPCA enters into private property to, to investigate. Mm -hmm. The OSPCA does have a handbook that guides its, um, its officers on under what circumstances should they enter a property without a warrant. That handbook is private. So the people of Ontario are not allowed to see the basis upon which the, the OSPCA um, officers make that decision. And well, I think that goes back to the core issue of the people of Ontario cannot have confidence in an enforcement system when they're not even allowed to know the rules. And even if they found out that, they, that the rules have been broken, there's no mechanism for, for them to b bring complaints because the OSPCA is not under the Police Services Act. Let me follow up with Camille in this regard. I've heard on a CBC report that the OSPCA isn't even going onto people's farms and doing investigations into allegations of cruelty against horses because, because of the controversy we're talking about right now. Can you help us out with that at all? I think this discussion is really illuminating. It, it highlights a couple major problems with our animal welfare system. So there's the issue of enforcement in the first place. Uh, right now, enforcement of laws uh, on farms is complaint-based. 
That's because we don't have proactive inspections. And the reason we don't have proactive regular inspections of farms is because there are no laws. There's no standards, no regulations governing the lives of animals on farms from the minute that they're born to the day that they're shipped for transport. So for the OSPCA to even have an ability to go on those farms depends on members of the public or a worker perhaps complaining. And that happens so rarely. And it really demonstrates, I think, why uh, the system is a problem. Animals are kept behind closed doors. They can't report abuse themselves. Uh, and there's nobody there actively looking for that abuse. Let me now double back, Kendra, to where you were a few moments ago when you said we're now at a fork in the road, and, uh, in the road rather. And the province of Ontario has some options about which way we're going to go to ensure that animals are well treated. What are the options that we're looking at right now? What do you like? Stay the course, but increase the scrutiny and oversight mm -hmm. of the OSPCA. Again, I think there would be questions about is the funding sufficient if that route is continued. Well, uh, let me just understand that. Do you want them to continue to have the animal welfare enforcement powers? Uh, I think it's... It's, it's a challenging situation for a charity, as you mentioned. It's mm -hmm. reliant on fundraising and donations to then simultaneously have to do what can be unpopular law enforcement work. And just yesterday, the Edmonton Humane Society announced that it was going to be backing away from enforcement altogether, hmm. um, perhaps uh, you know, influenced by its own history or the ruling in Ontario. Or, but their, their argument was, we're not best equipped to enforce the law. And I think that's the fundamental question. Is humane law enforcement a public responsibility or should it be assigned to private organizations now again increasingly the world is saying that it's public responsibility so we already have national uh, animal crimes units in the police forces of the netherlands Nor norway for example how about here uh, in manitoba has a bit of an interesting approach they, mm. they have publicly funded animal uh, protection officers in quebec as well uh, yeah and also newfoundland yeah and there's <laughs> some regions where the police enforce in the united states SPCAs are only enforcing uh, about 7% of the time, of the agencies that are doing the enforcement. It's about 47% police, 47, 46, 47% uh, municipally funded animal control offices, and then SPCAs are in the minority. So there are a number of possibilities. I also think there's a really important role for partnerships, which is what is the role of an animal welfare charity? They are experts in animal care, in animal welfare, in sheltering, in adoptions, in humane education. Perhaps we decide that's the ideal role for them in our society, but they can be supporting police. They can be working directly with police. That's what's happening in New York. There's an official partnership between the ASPCA, so the American mm -hmm. SPCA, and the NYPD, where the police have a basic level of training. There's a specialized uh, unit the Animal Cruelty Investigation Squad, hmm. which has a lieutenant and seven detectives uh, who are working on it. And that's at par with you know, the Special Victims Unit or the Domestic Violence Unit. It's taken very seriously. Hmm. Officers also have a 1-800 number they call. They can call it 24-7. They reach the ASPCA police liaisons. So the officers aren't required to have profound knowledge. They just have a basic level of training. Their eyes are open. They're attuned to this sort of these, these issues. And then they're able to partner and work directly with the ASPCA. They can offer veterinary forensics, animal care, veterinary care, a lot of community engagement, preventative work. Perhaps that's something that, that works well. And you know, again, because there are a lot of humane societies and the OSPCA officers uh, who, who are very dedicated uh, and I think that they need to be respected and, and have a really important role to play. We just want to figure out what is the best respons responsibility sharing. Well, let's bring that more local here. Do you have any reason to believe, Camille, that uh, regional police services in this province or the Ontario Provincial Police have the expertise to handle calls that deal with cruelty to animals? I think expertise can be built. What we know they do have expertise in is policing. They understand how to investigate, how to collect evidence, how to take a case to trial, and that's a really important part. Um, SPCAs uh, may not always have that expertise and must seek it out elsewhere. So uh, expertise from the OSPCA could be incorporated into a regional or provincial policing model, and I think it would be a shame to lose all of the knowledge that the OSPCA has built up over the years. So partnerships might be a good option, but I think the fundamental value that we should be keeping in mind is that there must be a public system. Akash, what's your view on that? I feel that we're in a situation where we have to think about not just what would be the ideal solution, but what is the feasible solution in the current political climate. I think it is extremely unlikely that police forces in Ontario would take over the enforcement of, of animal welfare laws. Why not? Two reasons. First of all, of the 15,000 complaints I mentioned that the OSPCA investigated in 2017, only tw there were only 21 criminal charges. And I think that... 21 it, out of 15,000? Yes, there were about 570 hmm. provincial charges, but only 21 criminal charges. And I think that the typical police chief would look at those figures and think, if statistically the probability of this resulting in a charge is zero, 
am I going to redeploy police, uh, police resources away from crimes affecting people to crimes affecting animals? And I think in most cases, the, the answer would be no. And indeed, I think if one looks at the RCMP as a, as a model, we already know the answer to that. The RCMP is responsible to enforce the Animal Pedigree Act. But when I was head of, of um, Equine Canada, I, had, I corresponded with the RCMP about this, and I have letters from the RCMP saying flatly, we will not enforce this law because we don't have the resources to do so. I think that's the hard reality of the situation. And under those circumstances, I think that the OSPCA should continue to enforce the law. However, it should definitely, it's an, I think there should be firewalls set up between fundraising, law enforcement, and commercial services like shelters so that there can't be a cross-contamination between the three, three streams. I think also its law enforcement um, should be subject to the Police Services Act or to an equivalent piece of legislation. And I think all of it has to be, has to be brought under the Freedom of Information Act. It has to be subject to the Auditor General. It has to be subject to the, uh, to the Ombudsman, and it has to report to Parliament. Ultimately, I don't think we want to lose the expertise in the OSPCA, but I think it has to be made publicly and democratically accountable. Let me put all that to Brian. If mm. the provincial government intervened and said, OK, we have a court decision here, we've got to change the way the OSPCA does business, they are going to be subject to freedom of information requests, they are going to come under the auspices of the Auditor General or the Ombudsman or, you know, whatever, some of these institutions of Parliament, independent right. institutions of provincial Parliament, would the OSPCA, uh, in your view, want to continue doing its animal enforcement responsibilities? Well, there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. First, let's be clear. The OSPCA has never said it wouldn't want to be subject to oversight. They've never taken that position. They just the, haven't been. They just have not been. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, one of the fundamental problems I'll get back to is resourcing. Mm -hmm. And so to... To answer your question directly is very difficult. Would the OSPCA, with just oversight added into it, continue to do enforcement work? It, it, it can do that, but is it really advisable with a contract of five and a half million dollars annually okay, so to this do comes those down work? To money. Well, it comes down to money because you, you can't resource it. Everybody on this panel has said the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, you, you can get a model that works if you have the money to do it and, and the will to do it. Remember, we're in the social media age. Every day, people are looking on uh, their Twitter feeds, on Instagram, and they're seeing the abuse of animals uh, over and over again. And they're, they're very attuned to it. And the government isn't. And the government needs to catch up with what the people are seeing and caring about. I hear you. But on the other hand, uh, Kendra, I'll put this to you. The, the current Ontario government does not seem, at least, to be interested in spending more money than it already has committed to these issues, given that it's got a, and pick your number here, $15 billion deficit, $14.5 billion deficit, $12.5 billion deficit, whatever the number is, it's big. Do you expect the Ontario government to spend more money to resource all of the things we've been talking about here? Let's also keep in mind that this is a government that believes in law and order. This is a government that wants effective law enforcement. This is about animals, and there's broad-based support for animal protections. I mean, I'm conducting a public survey right now, stopanimalcruelty.ca, <laughs> gauging the views of the public on this issue. The numbers are exceeding my wildest expectations because people feel very passionately about this issue. At the same time, this is about law enforcement. This is a government that believes in law and order, that has, the Premier has spoken openly about needing more police on the ground. Uh, so that could be playing into the, uh, doesn't this consideration. Spend any more money, Kendra. He doesn't want to spend any more he money. He has already devoted $25 million mm. over four years to combating gun violence. And so I think that bodes well for the mm. idea of supporting animals. I Animal protection support cuts across party lines. It's not a right-wing issue. It's not a left-wing issue. When you pull people consistently, over 90% that they say that they want stronger animal cruelty laws and better enforcement. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that of the $4.4 billion devoted to policing in this province, that we maybe put $100 million towards the animals. I, I agree that, um, that animal welfare is a cross-party issue mm -hmm. and that you will... I don't think you're going to find someone who will come on the show to say that he or she is in favour of animal cruelty. And when I look at, we've talked about, a bit about the origins of the OSPC being in the Royal, Soci Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. I'm conscious of the fact that when one looks at public donations in the United Kingdom, British people give a lot more money to the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals than they do to the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. 
having said that, ha having said that, I'm also conscious that as we are sitting in the studio having this conversation, we are in the midst, the province of Ontario is in the midst of a 45-day consultation over the Ontario Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. And the expressed purpose that the government, government has given for that review is to find efficiencies for business, to find ways of attenuating the act to reduce cost for businesses and to reduce government expenditures. I feel, I wish I felt more optimistic that a government who has said that, we are go that it's going to reduce expenditure on, in, on protecting endangered species is a government that's going to increase expenditure on protecting animal welfare. I'm afraid I simply don't see it. So at the moment then, if you think you've seen something that is troubling, call the police? Well, at the moment, call the police, call 310 SPCA. It's a 24 seven hotline that uh, will connect you to the OSPCA to report a complaint or report abuse. Um, you know, I'll add the OSPCA's contract with the government expires on March 31st of this year. Hmm. And um, what happens from there is an open debate. So you need, a you, you need the government to decide something in the next two months. The government, I will tell you, advised through the Ministry of the Attorney General yesterday that they are appealing the decision. So You know that. They've told you that. They have. So um, uh, that may delay things to some extent. Uh, mm -hmm. An appeal may be heard sometime later this year. Um, where that takes us is a whole other thing. But, um, you know, the government has some decisions to make regardless of the appeal mm -hmm. with a contract that expires uh, at the end of March of this year. Camille, if the... If, uh, Appears they are now appealing the decision. Are you back in court then? Well, absolutely back in court, <laughs> making sure that the animals' interests are first and forefront at the Court of Appeal hearing. I expect there will be other interveners too. And uh, this is a, obviously something that's going to be decided by a higher court. This idea of a principle of fundamental justice is not something that uh, courts take lightly. It's a very big deal to introduce a new one, as was done in this case. So a higher court will review that. But more broadly, this is a point of departure from public discussion, and that's already happening both in Ontario and across the country. As Kendra mentioned, the Edmonton Humane Society has backed away from doing enforcement. Manitoba already has a different model. Newfoundland has a different model. This conversation is starting to happen, and I think that all Ontarians should be engaged in it. So we're encouraging, through animal justice, uh, citizens to contact their members of provincial parliament and make sure that their views are known on this because this issue is something politicians need to hear from us on. Yep, I've got 30 seconds left. How would you like to see this all resolved? I don't make any predictions ever since Donald Trump became elected <laughs> president of the United States. But, you know, we've got these beautiful horses, thanks to the great folks at the agenda here, uh, who, who some of whom are starving. Uh, alone in barns behind closed doors and no one can see them. We have, you know, dogs being kicked, cats being burned. Uh, these things are going on and we need to mm -hmm. fundamentally know that this is an issue, quite literally, uh, of life and death and it needs to be taken very seriously. Mr. Director, would you give us, thank you very much, a wide shot so I can thank everybody for coming into TVO tonight, helping us out with this uh, most timely and important conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.